the, the Dropbox file I sent you, I'm going to use those scriptures today. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the three manifestations of faith, the three ways that faith shows up in our lives. We're a people of faith, amen? We're a people of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We must be a people of faith. We're faith people. But faith shows up three different ways in the scripture. And faith is not linear. Faith is not just one thing. It's not something that you can compare to someone else. Faith shows up in unique ways. And we want to learn today the three ways that faith shows up. And we need to use and learn to use all three. All three. Some of you don't even realize you're using faith right now, and it doesn't even feel like you've got faith. And you don't even understand how much faith you have. There's a little bit of faith in just getting dressed and going to church. Some folks couldn't keep doing that. They gave up their faith. But just the fact that you got dressed and came to church today tells me and tells God that you at least have some faith. Because you would have not gone through that journey to get here without a little bit of faith that something's going to happen today in the service. And God will use that faith. So we've got faith, Luke 18, 27, and he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Everybody say, it's possible. You've got to get that word in your spirit today that everything's possible. With God, everything's possible. You've got to get that in your heart. With God, it's possible. With man, it's not all possible. Everybody say, I'm limited, but God is not. You have to have both revelations. You have to have the revelation of your limitation, and you have to have the revelation that God can do anything. You need both at the same time. If you believe you can do it without God, then it doesn't matter that God can do it. you got to have a revelation that you're limited, and that's not a bad thing. And that doesn't hurt your faith. That helps your faith. Because when you recognize I'm limited, there's only one hope for you now, and that is in Jesus Christ. Our faith soars when we have limitation. Our faith soars when we recognize I'm just a man. I'm just a human. I need the Lord to help me. I must put my faith in Jesus. Everybody say in Jesus' name. You can be seated. Thank you for coming today. I'm glad you're here. Three manifestations of faith. Thank you to the worship team, music team. Boy, I love that song uh, that y'all were singing in the beginning. And uh, God bless you, Bumper. We can, you can be seated if you'd like. And uh, the Lord is good. The Lord is with us. So. But I, I love that worship song that they, they sang this morning, uh, the praise, the Lord one. And we put that one on repeat in our house. And uh, it's, it's awesome. How many is ready for the word today? Yeah. Amen. God lives in the realm of impossibilities. He can do anything. There is nothing impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for God. Sometimes that's our frustration because we think God should do everything we want Him to do. Sometimes we think that God should do every single thing we pray for, but nothing is impossible with God. God is just so smart that God does what's right. God does not do everything we ask. If God did everything we ask, we'd be God. He'd be our servant. He'd be our genie in a bottle. And so God doesn't do everything we ask, but He could. He could do anything. Our God can do anything because He lives in the realm of impossibility. But we as human beings, we've got to agree today that we're limited. And we live in the realm of possibility. There are certain things that we can do without God because God put it in our ability and our nature to climb mountains like Mount Everest. You can be an atheist and survive that trip. You might turn into a Christian before it's over. But you can be an atheist and do some pretty incredible things. You can believe in your ability and get a lot done. If you can believe in yourself and do a lot of things. Listen, if you believe in yourself, that's good for the realm of possibility. If you have confidence in your ability, that's good. That's good in this realm. That's good for things that are possible. You can do hard things if you believe in yourself. You can do difficult things if you believe in yourself. Believing in yourself is good to the edge of possibility. But believing in yourself will not take you beyond possibility. 
Your self-confidence will only take you so far. You cannot cross that chasm between possible and possible. You must bow the knee to Jesus to ever have anything happen in the impossible realm. Doctors can help you with a lot. They can help you with a lot of your cancer. They can help you with a lot of your problems. Uh, lawyers can help you with a lot of things. There are so many ways in America, in this modern world, for us to try hard, work hard, and, and some amazing things will take place because we believe in ourselves. We believe in people. We believe in machines and technology. But still, there's a realm of impossibility that we cannot get to in our ability. It's hard for us as Americans because we have so much access to so much possibility. It's hard for us to acknowledge that there are impossible things that only God can do. There's great pride in us because we have learned to trust in so many modern things to help us that this subject is difficult for us to grasp that we are just human and we are limited. We, we have to stay in this realm of ability to have things. We plant seeds we water the seeds, but God gives the increase. Nobody can make the seed grow, but you can sure put it in the ground. You can sure cultivate it. You can sure water it. That is the realm of ability. But the realm of impossible is when God steps in and says that this thing's going to grow. It's going to happen. It's only because of God. We do our part. God does his part. We do our sum. And God does the rest. We have to understand we're in partnership with God. There are certain things that we are responsible for that we must do. God will not do them for us. There are some things God will not do for you that you have to do for yourself. There are three primary ways that our faith is made manifest, brought to life, proof that you have it. Through our action, through our spoken word. And through stillness, according to Scripture, those are the three ways. All three of these are in the greater category of works. Because James tells us in James 2 and 14, What does it profit, my brethren, if somebody says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Listen to this. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and, and one of you walks up to them filled with the Holy Ghost power, and says, depart in peace, O oh, thou naked, destitute, hungry person. Depart in peace. Be warmed. Hallelujah. Be filled. Hallelujah. You can't preach some stuff into people. You can't get all super spiritual on some stuff. Some stuff is not running the aisles. Some stuff is not talking in tongues. Some stuff is getting your jacket out of your car and giving it away. It's not supernatural. It's not super spooky. It don't take a long prayer meeting. It's just common sense. The man is naked and he needs a jacket. Look what James is saying here. He's saying we get so spiritual with our faith, we just believe a jacket's going to appear out of thin air. Receive a jacket. Lord, that's your fault. <laughs> that ain't my fault. The Lord didn't want you to have a jacket. It must not have been the will of God to have a jacket. I'm wearing one, and he needs something. And James is saying we get so spiritual sometimes because we want to work in that impossible realm. We get addicted to the impossible, miraculous realm, and that gives us a free get-out-of-jail-free card where we never have to do anything for anybody because it's the miracle that they need. Well, if you just had enough faith, if you if you just had, if you could believe in miracles, it would it would you'd get a jacket, you'd get food, you'd get everything you'd need. And James is saying, God has given some of us plenty that we can't afford a jacket or, or a pair of clothes for somebody. Yeah, we can. We can't afford to give a meal to somebody. Sure, we can. We can't afford to help somebody find some, some warmth, get a sleeping bag. And so James is teaching them, these people that are new in the church, new Christians in the church, but but. Do you not give them the things which are needed for the body? What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, it does not have works. It's dead. You cannot speak to things by faith that you should work in. 
that you should do physically, tangibly. Verse 18, but someone will say, if you have faith and I have works, or you have faith and I have works, show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. So something has to manifest if you've got faith. It's impossible to have faith and nothing ever come out of you. Faith shows up. Faith is seen, but it's not all the same. It's not always action. It's not always speaking. Sometimes, we'll find out at the end, it's just standing still. So faith, also, faith always requires something of us, but mostly, mostly, faith requires our action. Everybody say action. Action is the most common way that faith shows up. Most common. It's the greatest way, probably, for us to show our faith, and that's to just do something about it. Faith is not lazy. Faith is not lazy. Faith has works. People that are working are people of faith. Faith is not lazy. Faith doesn't pray for things that you have the ability to perform yourself. There are some things I do not have to ask God for because God's already done them. God's already supplied it. God's already given you the ability. God's already put it in your spirit. Some things you already have the power to do, you don't have to wait on the Lord. You just got to go do it. You just got to be obedient to it. If your brother's naked and you've got the extra clothes, you can save yourself the prayer meeting and just give him the clothes. And let's make sure that we're staying in context. I like that the scripture says, if your brother is naked. Because our first priority is to those in the church, not those on the street. God forbid we would take those clothes and we skip right over those coming to the church and go to the people on the street just to get good publicity. If we got people here suffering, they get it first. And that encourages homeless folks to go to church. get it for free and not go to church, why go to church? You see, when you get in the kingdom of God, you get access to stuff when you're in trouble. I think everybody ought to go to church. It'd be good for you that are naked to go to church. You might find some clothes. It'd be good for you that are hungry out there watching online. You might want to find you a church. You might get some food. It'd be good for some of y'all who are cold and need a friend to just go to church. You can find a whole lot in church besides just Jesus. But, but people don't want to go to church because they don't understand how much we love each other, how much we care for each other, how much we help rescue you. I've seen people lose their job, and they find it in the church because there was somebody in the church that owned a business. But you want to go do your own thing, and you want to live out there on yourself, and you want to be like, how come no one loves me? You come up in the church, we're going to love you. You show up every Sunday, you're going to get some love. You join with this this family, this team, you're not going to stay naked very long because somebody's going to help you get out of the mess you're in. That's what we do. We're people of faith, and God supplies things, and God will help you. Since we're teaching this morning, I also like how how he didn't say, if your brother just lost his Ferrari, buy him a Mercedes Benz. The church loved me. They go get me a new Rolex. No. I owe you a jacket. It can be as cheap as it needs to be as long as it keeps you warm. Don't you start that. That's from the devil trying to get to come up in the church to get a bunch of freebie stuff. No, no, no. Once you really get in the church, you're the giver, not the taker. You're only the taker until you get in. When you get all the way in, you're trying to give your jacket away. So let's stay in the book here because people want to tell us Christians that we don't love people because we don't give them everything they ask for. Lord, I'm going to stay in Scripture here, okay? And so I like, I like this because we need to help each other, but there's some things we don't have to pray about. Real faith is actively involved, doing everything it humanly can to see the results. If I've got faith, I don't have to wait on God to do some things. I just need to say, God, if you can use me, use me. If I've got it, I'll give it. Whatever I can offer, I'll offer it. Most of the miracles in the Bible came to pass because of active faith. Someone say active faith. A widow came to the prophet Elisha seeking assistance in the Old Testament. Her boys were in trouble and she needed money quick. Her husband died and he was a follower of Elisha, the prophet. In 2 Kings 4 and 2, Elisha said to this woman, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, 
What hast thou in the house? What do you have to offer? Thy handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. She said, I don't have much, but what I have, I'm willing to work with. That, that poor, pitiful me mentality will make you not, not know that you've got at least a pot. See, sometimes we say, I don't have nothing. That's not true. You always have something. And if you can find the one little thing you've got left, it just takes a, a mustard sized seed. It just takes a little bit of faith. It doesn't take a whole lot for God to get you out of the situation that you're in, but you've got to be willing to give up what little you have left. Boy, when you're poor and you're broke, you don't want to give up your only pot. Preacher, do you hear what you're saying? I have got nothing. I need your help, and you're telling me you want my last pot? That's what we do whenever we come to church. We, we look at God and look at the preacher and say, you don't understand my situation. No, I do understand your situation. Unless you're willing to give up what you have left, nothing will ever change in your life. And so what's happening here is she was commanded to borrow empty vessels from her neighbor's and come back. And as long as she had a place to pour the oil, the little bit she had, it would continue to flow and fill all of the neighbor's vessels that she went and got. Her faith was in the action of being willing to give up what little she had so that it could be multiplied for more and turned into her blessing. She received so much she was able to pay all of her debt and have leftovers extra at the end because she had active faith. She didn't just sit down and die. She didn't just sit down and say, oh, well. She was able to be obedient to the man of God and take what little she had and go out there and look like a fool saying, hello, I'd like to have an empty bucket. This is the woman. Is this the, is this, is this the woman who has nothing? Yeah, that's the, that's the one. Why is the woman with nothing asking for Something to put something in. Talk about embarrassing. When you're the one who has nothing to give and nothing to fill, and you're going to ask for empty vessels, talk about your pride. Walking around, can you imagine walking in your neighborhood saying, I just need empty vessels? Why? You've got nothing. You're that lady that has nothing. Why do you want something to put something in when you've got nothing to fill it with? She had to go out there by faith and embarrass herself, ask for her neighbors to give her vessels to borrow, and she was delivered and free because she was willing to have active faith. Zacchaeus was, was in Luke 19, 1 through 5, he was on his way, Jesus was on his way through Jericho, and Zacchaeus was there, and Jack, Zacchaeus was a rich tax collector, and he wanted to see Jesus very badly. But he was a short man, and he couldn't see over the crowd. And so the Bible says that he was uh, a smart man, too. He ran ahead of the crowd. He saw where they were going by, and the Bible says he climbed a tree. And verse 5 says that when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and he said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Jesus Watch this, came to the place, not to the person. The Bible says that when Jesus got to the place, he looked up. Because Jesus is no, res Jesus is no respecter of persons. Jesus is respecter of places. Jesus doesn't treat us differently. Jesus blesses those who climb trees. He's a respecter of faith. Somebody in this room today... Your neighbor has it not because God likes them more, but because they're willing to climb trees more than you are. They're willing to work for it more than you are. They're willing to stop making excuses about how God let them be short, and they're trying to find a way out of the situation they're in, and God will always move according to your faith. A.K.A. according to your action. And if you're sick and tired of not having the view you need of Jesus, you need to make your mind up, nothing's going to stop me from getting to see over that crowd into Jesus. I'll climb anything I've got to climb, but I'm going to see Jesus today. God responds to your active faith. This separates people who really want to see Jesus from people who just 
are content to be in the back row. Here's how, here's how it works. Faith separates us, the serious ones, from those who are casual. And when you have real faith, you invest works, action. And in the end, you get to make contact with Jesus like nobody else. Remember that woman who crawled with the issue of blood pressing through the crowd? Everybody was touching Jesus that day. But when she touched him, he, he said, who, who touched me? Or at least we assume everyone was touching him that day. In other words, the touch was the same, but the faith must have been greater. If everyone in that crowd was pressed against him like we believe was possible, there was something different about her touch. She was willing to crawl to get to Jesus. Active faith made the difference. In John 5, 5 and 7, there was a lame man at the pool of Bethesda. The Bible says a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. And when Jesus saw him and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Will you want to be made whole? And that impotent man answered and said, Sir, I don't have anybody to, to help me get into the water when the water is troubled. And it's time for a miracle to put me in the pool. And while I'm coming, while I'm still moving, while I'm crawling, another steps down before me and gets there. He said, yes, I try, I try, I try. I just don't get there in time. I crawl. I do my best in the situation I am in. I'm still not going to make excuses. I'm going to do my best to get there with what energy I've got left. Out of all the people that Jesus chose to heal at that pool, he chose to heal someone who didn't quit working for it. Your faith shows up in action. So before we get too carried away, have you ever been up against something so big that it seemed like action would be pointless? I mean, it was just too much. And it was just too big. And you couldn't climb a tree big enough. Because that's real too. You couldn't crawl through the crowd enough. And it just seemed like there is nothing to do. I know you may be there right now where you think you've done everything. There's an answer for that. And there's a way for us to rise above that. In Matthew 17 and 20, Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. We find the next level of faith, and that is not faith that chips away at the mountain. <laughs> You're going to be there a long time. I mean, if you took that first doctrine of faith and you were working to move the mountain, it would take you your lifetime, and you'd have about 15 foot chipped out. Because, church family, there are some things you cannot work. You cannot actively change. There are some things too big for you. There are some things you can't crawl to, climb over. There are some things you can't tear down, dig up. There are some things that are physically, literally beyond your human ability. And all you can do in those situations is speak to them. We have got to understand that sometimes faith shows up in just what you say. And for every time in your life you can't work out of it, you can't push through it, you can't climb over it, you can't dig under it, you don't know what to do, you can speak to it. And speaking faith works when you can do nothing else. The problem, church family, is sometimes we speak to things that we should be working for. Like James said, do not speak to your brother, be clothed. Because speaking faith is reserved for those who've tried everything else. Speaking, commanding with authority is not a lazy way out of working. I know many Christians who speak out of everything. They don't want to work out anything. I know Christians who go to church 
And churches that they speak it and speak it and speak it and declare it and take authority. You can't take authority over someone naked. You've got to go buy some clothes at Walmart and take it to them. It's a super spiritual, pseudo spiritual feeling that I can speak everything into existence. But the Bible tells us that we save our speech for moving mountains out of our way. Anything you cannot move and you cannot work and you cannot do a thing about them physically, you've got nothing left but to speak to it. And the good news is Jesus said, I'll move that thing out of your way when you can't move it. Put it all together, church family. Are you speaking over things that you should be working for? I speak over my marriage. I don't want to take her on a date no more. I speak over my children, but I ain't got time for you. Go play the iPad. But I speak over you. Y'all feeling me right now? I speak over me. I'm going to get married. But I'm not going on dates. I declare a husband in my future. But I'm not going to take a risk. I'm not going to prepare myself to be ready for marriage. I'm not going to go to any conferences and meet anybody. I'm just going to stay right here and speak it. My friend, this is not a speaking faith moment. This is a get up in your car and go to the conference moment. Speak all you want to. There's some things you've got to do with your faith. And we get all spiritual and we just want to speak over stuff. I speak over that city. Receive Jesus. Get up. Go to outreach today. You are wasting your time speaking over things that you need to go to, put your hands on, look in the eyeballs with, uh, and use what you can in faith to do. But we've got to get the right realm, the right place, y'all, because we get caught up sometimes with this faith stuff, and we speak to things that we're too scared to deal with. Y'all, speaking is reserved for things you can't do. Everybody say, do what you can. Someone today needs to hear me when I tell you there are a lot of things you could do that you don't have to say a word. And you'll start to exercise your faith. The greatest way we prove our faith is through action. And when you can do nothing else, God gives you a backup plan. And God says, okay, now you can't do it. I'm going to let you just tell it to move. And I'll move it for you. Before you speak and command things to move, first ask yourself the question, can I move it? I, I speak over this pornography. Won't you speak over your feet to walk away from the computer? You're speaking over stuff that you have the power to quit. You may not have power over the temptation, but you've got power over what you do with your time. You got power of how late you are at night sitting on your phone. You got power who you hang out with and if you're accountable and who shares your passwords. You, there are things you can do in this realm that you don't have to pray about. But you know when you need to, when you, when you need to speak over it? Speak over when you've done all that and you're still tempted. And then you start to say, in the name of Jesus, you get that spirit out of me. In the name of Jesus, I don't even have it around me, but I still feel a temptation for it. That's when you speak. Because that thing is now so big that you can't just get away. You can't just get away. You've got to now speak in the name of Jesus. And that mountain, it will be moved. So I'm just trying to teach today, church family. Learn when it's time to work and learn when it's time to speak. But just make sure it's not something you should be doing. We, we speak over our lost loved ones. I just don't know what to do, Pastor. I, just, I love them. They're lost. I speak over them that they'll be saved, but at Thanksgiving you fight with them. You don't live like a Christian in front of them. You know, you, you want your kids to be saved, then you talk about the church and the pastor in front of them. There's, some, there's just things we need to change and not speak about. Save your mouth for things you don't, you not, you can't do them. Y'all, I've gotten in trouble speaking over things I should have worked on. I've gotten in trouble opening up my big mouth over stuff that I should have just been quiet and served. 
showed my faith and showed my love. Let's don't fall for that, church family. Let's find that faith manifests through first action and then secondarily when you can do nothing else. Learn to have authority over mountains in your life. It is the will of God to understand that we've got the power in our mouth to declare mountains to move away from us when they're in our pathway. If it is the will of God for you to go this way and the mountain is before you and you cannot move it or shift it, the Bible tells us that if I command the mountain to move, that my God will pick that thing up and move it out of my way. But I fear we have not seen mountains move. Because we have not clothed the naked. God is wanting us to first learn to use our faith just to act. And when you can conquer acting, you upgrade to speaking. Brother Matthew, a lot of us, we just want to speak over everything because it's our lazy way out. <laughs> you know what this world needs? Less talk. More action. You believe that? Y'all, you know what's hurt Christianity? It's this charismatic movement of blab it and grab it. Pie in the sky. Speak, I speak, I speak. The world is sick of Christians that talk. Just be quiet for a season. Go get a jacket and give it away. The world is desperate to see Christians act and not just talk their way through. Is that right, Sister Jamie? Isn't that right? That's what we're doing in this city with Love and Austin. We're saying enough talk about how much we love our city. Enough talk about, oh, we got to win the loss. Enough talk. Get in your car. Go at 3.30 and let's love on somebody. Go on Friday at 12 o'clock and help somebody. Go at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning and love somebody. Stop talking about how you care. Stop putting a blessing on them in the atmosphere. Speak over my city. Go into your city. That's real faith. Yep. When you've tried everything you can think of, you may have to try just speaking over it. And that's going to happen, church family. There's going to be times when you can do nothing. Y'all, there have been times I was locked up. I was in some kind of a spiritual trance. Chains of hell were wrapped around me, and I, I, I literally was almost paralyzed. And I, I've been there where I couldn't even move. And all I could call out was the name of Jesus. All I could do was begin to plead the name of Jesus over my situation. And all of a sudden, that mountain began to move in front of me. And I began to feel my liberty. And I've been there, and I know so have you. There are some of you in the room right now, you have tried it all. There's some of you in the room right now, you have lifted every finger. You've moved every rock. And there's nothing left to do but to get up and begin to declare victory over it in the name of Jesus. There is life in your tongue. Life and death is in the tongue. Your words are creative. Your words create atmospheres for things to shift and things to change. Why can we speak to the mountain? Because that mountain was made through speech. Our God spoke that thing into existence. He can speak that thing out of there. God didn't build the earth with his hands. He spoke it into existence. That's why there's power when you speak over it. But just don't speak over anything you're supposed to work. We good? Okay. Mark 10, 46 through 52, Jesus is on his way to Jericho. Blind Bartimaeus heard that he was passing by. He had to hear, obviously. And he couldn't find him physically. Nobody would help him find Jesus. So he did the only thing that he knew to do. And he lifted up his voice, and he began to cry out to the Lord to help him. And there are times when you can't do anything but speak. There are times when you don't know where to go. There are times when you feel blinded. You feel like you don't have anybody helping you. And you just think that Jesus may be a little closer than he was last week. And in those moments, your deliverance is going to come 
by lifting up your voice, crying out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I don't know where to go. I don't know who to call. I need you, Jesus. And in that moment, in that context, the blind man could do nothing else. And if that's you today, cry out to Jesus. And he will deliver you. Furthermore, in Acts 16, Paul and Silas were locked up in the prison one night. Everybody say they were locked up? Can't do anything when you're locked up. <laughs> Anybody ever been locked up? Don't raise your hand. Some of y'all like, well, that's the truth. Last night, woo, it was... Thank y'all for bailing me out. <laughs> Paul and Silas were locked up in prison. We got a few around our church that can relate to this scripture. And their impossibilities were staring at them in the face because they literally, literally could not change their situation. I don't know if we've ever, really ever been there many times where we really were locked up physically. But these guys were locked up physically, walls on every side, unbreakable chains holding them down. The Bible says at the midnight hour, of course, at the midnight hour, when it's the darkest, it seems like, and there's no hope, Paul and Silas began to do the only thing they could do. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the singing that set them free. It wasn't the praise that set them free. It was them doing all they could that set them free. We want to magnify and glorify the thing they did, but you're missing the root behind the fruit. What came out of them was faith. What do you do when you're locked up? What do you do when you've got nothing you can do? You can't move, and nobody's going to set you free. Nobody's going to rescue you. Nobody's going to come get you out. All you can do sometimes when your hands are locked down and you can't physically move is there's one thing you can keep doing, and that is you can lift up your voice and begin to give God a praise. I believe God set them free not because of praise but because of faith. I've seen folks praise that didn't have faith. Some of y'all can shout across this church and still be bound. Because you thought your power was in your praise, but your power is not in your praise. Your power is doing everything you can do to get out of what you're in. Sometimes all you can do is praise God. So go ahead and praise Him. Sometimes all you can do is just go ahead and lift a shout up to God. Sometimes you're so stuck and so trapped and it feels like there's no hope. All you can do is start to glorify God and sing praises to God. And guess what happened when they did all that they could do? There was a great earthquake. I'm trying to teach you today that the answer is not in the thing they did. The answer is in what they had. They had faith in God in the midst of the prison cell. Y'all, faith causes earthquakes, not praise. And if you can have faith in the darkest of moments, sometimes all you'll be able to do is lift your voice up and give God praise. And I'm telling you right now, that's all you need. Because that praise, that all I can do faith, is chain-breaking faith. It's ground-shaking faith. It's jail cell opening faith. It's not in how pretty it looked. It's not about your situation. It's about the fact that you should have given up, but you didn't give up. You still believe the Lord is worthy to be praised in the midst of your storm, in the midst of your trial. It's called faith. Sometimes you just got, sometimes all you can do is shout. But listen to me once again. Some of y'all act like, we, we act like sometimes, well, I'm going to go ahead and shout, Lord, because that's all I can do. Not true. The brother's still naked and you're shouting around them. You can't shout somebody's clothes on. You can shout them off. But you can't. I've seen them shout them off. Well, I, and when y'all women start falling down, I got to take my clothes off to cover y'all up. <laughs> we all start getting naked. But some of us, y'all, we get so spiritual because we we take that scripture, be like, oh yeah, I know, I know just what they're going through. I'm locked up too. <laughs> well, I can relate with Paul and Silas because I feel like I'm in a prison. I couldn't afford my Starbucks this week. I feel trapped. I just feel financially like I'm in jail. I. I my kids won't go to soccer games. I couldn't take them. I feel like I'm in a prison. I just need to shout my way through. 
And that's what we do. We try to relate to scriptures and we, we pull out stuff to make it easier on our faith. And we go, well, that's me right now. No, it's not. Why don't you, hey, I got news for you. Save that one for the next 20 years when you really do go to jail for, for worshiping God. There's going to come a day when you're going to be able to be like, what's that one scripture? Oh, yeah, <laughs> let's start praising God. But look, right now, you might not need to praise God because you, your feet can move to that person across church and say, I forgive you. You, you don't need to shout through some stuff. You don't need to praise your way out of some stuff. Sometimes you need to stop praising and go use your faith. Because, boy, we get caught up in our Pentecostal stuff, don't we? We got real problems in this world. We got real problems in our families, and we just want to shout our way through. Yeah? Save your shouting for when you've got nothing left. Because there's going to come a time in your life when you've got nothing left to do. And when you've got nothing left to do and you feel trapped and you've tried everything, shout to God and the earth will shake. In that moment, shout to God and chains will break. In that moment, shout to God and the jail will open up. There will be a season for your shouting to produce a miracle, but it's not every time. Our marriages don't need shouting. I got enough shouting. <laughs> Our marriages need action. And if you're going to speak, speak life, not death. If you're going to speak to your kids, speak life, not death. If you're going to speak over our church, speak life, not death. Let's learn to use faith in context. Yeah, we can still learn a few things. We haven't figured it all out yet. But we have to pause here we got to hold on because there are still moments in life, scary moments, that the rare nightmares come true and you're literally staring death in the face and you find yourself paralyzed and you can't act, you can't even speak. That's happened. Surely that's happened to you before. When you had no words to pray. You had no praise to give. But some of us are still here today. I'll admit to you that I haven't always batted a thousand on my faith when it comes to action. There's been times I sat down in the mully grubs and, and had a little pity party. I haven't always spoken faith. There's been times I was so wrecked by what my trial was, so under attack, that I couldn't muster up strength to move. I couldn't muster up the faith to speak. What's left for people like us in those moments? There are times in Scripture when you cannot do anything but stand still. This is not weakness. This is not a lack of faith. This is simply all you have but the good news is, it's enough. Exodus 14, the people of God are led by Moses. They're in a dead end. There's water all before them. They are defenseless. The entire Egyptian army is coming to kill them. It's going to be a brutal death because God had just killed their firstborn. And the Egyptian army, the greatest military of their time, is on their way on their way to destroy every last one of the millions of God's people as they sit there trapped, the Red Sea in front of them. There is nowhere to go. There is nothing that they can do. And Moses said in verse 13, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. You have been there before? Yeah, I've been there before. Which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen go, seen today, you will not see them again. Verse 14, and the Lord shall fight for you. And watch this, and you shall hold your peace. There are some things 
so tough, you can't shout your way out of them. There are some things so tough, you can't speak anything and change it. But listen, in those moments that seem so scary, so horrible, you don't have to do anything. Because God is going to do it all for you. There, there are moments when we get zero credit for the salvation. Oh, well, it was according to your faith that you got healed. Oh, it was according to your shout that the mountain moved. Oh, if, if, because you sung the song in prison, God came through. We always get a little bit of glory when we use our faith. But the one time, the one time God gets all the glory is when it's so bad, you can't even move. So bad, you can't even speak. In those moments of life when you feel like there's nothing left for me to do, you're exactly right. There's nothing left for you to do. There is a lot left for God to do. And in those moments, it's sometimes the hardest to stand still. You know what happens whenever you're getting chased down? You want to run. Don't tell me to stand still when a bear is chasing me. They say when a bear is chasing you, you're supposed to make yourself look big and just challenge it. <laughs> Most folks don't do that. They run. And, and what they tell us is the bear sees your running as weakness. And the bear knows it probably could kill you because you're afraid of it. But who really stands in the face of the adversary and just doesn't talk and doesn't move and doesn't do, doesn't do anything? I tell you today, that takes faith. It takes faith when you don't understand it, but you stay. It takes faith when you don't have the words and you stay. It takes faith when all you see is doom and gloom and you still stay. There have been times in my life that my greatest challenges, I couldn't work out of them. I couldn't speak to them. I just had to outlive them. I just had to stand there and watch the power of God move in my life. Sometimes it takes the most faith to do nothing. The devil tries to tell you you're weak, and you say, I am. And the devil tries to tell you you can't do this. You're right, I can't. And the devil says, look at you standing still right now. You've lost your faith. But you look at him, and when he tells you you lost your faith, and say, no, because look at me. I'm not running. I may not be working, and I may not be speaking, but I will tell you this, Satan, I'm not running. I'm going to stand here until my God comes through. I'm going to stand here until he, he takes care of this problem. I'm not backing up. I'm not turning away. I'm standing still, and I'm going to watch my God take care of everything in front of me, and I'm not going to lift a finger. I'm not going to say a word, but I'm also not going to run away. I want you to know, church member, there's going to be times in your walk with God when you will not have words to say and you will have no power. But listen, when you're done, God gets all the glory. And I'm not lazy because I'm standing still. It's hard to stand still when somebody's coming at you like that. Don't you ever think that by enduring trials you're weak there are some things you just got to outlast. There are some things you just got to keep coming over. Sometimes you just got to keep going to church when that's all you can do. Sometimes you just got to keep doing what you know is right, standing still. I don't have the words. I don't have the works. But I know that God is for me. I know he's called me. And I know that this is going to work out for my good. So until then, I'm going to stand still. And I'm going to see the salvation of the Lord.
three ways that God's going to show faith. You're going to show faith in the kingdom of God. Not always through your action, not always through your words, sometimes just by standing still. Standing still. Let me close. Some battles you can't fight for victory on. You can't speak for victory on. You simply have to wait on the victory. There are times in our lives where our faith will require us to just stand still and let God be God. And let our enemies be scattered. And I submit to you all today, it takes the most faith to not fight. Hold your peace and just let God fight it for you. I, I, by nature, I'm a fighter. I like to get stuff done. Not physically, but I, I, I like, I'm determined. I'm driven. I like to see results. And one of the hardest ways for me to master my faith is in by being still. You know what the Lord did or allowed happened to me, Brother George, about four years ago? He allowed me to have a neck injury that hurt my ability to move. He stripped away from me, allowed me to be stripped away from my ability to do things physically. And now I have to trust in him more and not my own ability. <laughs> and it has caused a great deal of frustration in me because I have to acknowledge I'm just a human. I'm limited. And I can't do this without God. So there are times my victory came not from anything I've done, but simply because I stood still in the face of all my adversity, and I did not budge in my faith. And I'm going to tell you, there's some battles you'll never win until you understand you've just got to wait them out, stare them down, and watch God work them out. Some battles you're facing right now, you can do nothing about them. Let that sink in for a second. And if you can't do anything about them and it has nothing to do with your works and your voice, guess who gets all of the glory when you come through it? Trust me when I tell you, Brother Brandon, we need to see the glory of God. We need less of us and more of him. We need to know that he's our savior, he's our helper, he's our way out of no way. We need to see the glory of God. And sometimes that means we've got to acknowledge there's nothing we can do to fix it. My Lord, what are you going through right now that only God can get you through? I'm talking to someone right now that you keep saying, I just don't know what to do. And I've got a word for you today. Nothing. Give up. Stop trying. Learn how to stand still for a second and shut your mouth. Let God be God. Because if you can ever learn to stand still as the enemy runs down the hill at you, you'll see God do things he's, you've never seen before. You'll see victories you've never witnessed before. And you'll see, a, you'll see a power of God you've never seen. Let's lift our hands and love the Lord, can we? Oh, that's the faith the Lord wants us to have in the last days right there. Some of you are coming to the realization that you, you thought you could get out of this one. But no, this, is, this will take much more. This will take a great faith. This will take a faith where you've got to endure it, you've got to stand still, and you've got to let God be God in your life. And that's what God is calling us to be in the last days. He's calling us to be able to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord in this crazy world we're living in. We can't work out of all this stuff. We can't speak all this stuff. But we can always see the salvation of our God. We will not go down. We will not be defeated. But if we can learn to stand still and let our God work out these battles, we will have a victory. Praise God. I'm not telling you you're not going to fight. You'll fight later to get into your promised land. There, there's going to be a season we fight. 
But you can't learn to fight if you can't learn to let God fight. If you can't let God fight, then you're not going to trust God when the time comes. Here's what every believer in this room needs to know. Is that when you can do nothing, God will do everything. Nothing inspires faith like going through a season where Egyptians come in to kill you and God rescues you. Nothing eradicates fear like that. Nothing lets you trust God like just standing still and knowing that God loves you so much that you can't earn it through your works and you can't be good enough to deserve it. But just the fact that he's called you out of darkness into this marvelous light, he will rescue you from all trouble, from this evil world, he will set you free. But sometimes you've got to use your faith to just stand there. If there's anything that I feel like I have done for years that I can, I can impart to you, and that is my ability to trust in God for hardships. And I know I've got flaws, and I may not be able to give other things to you as your pastor, but in the season we're in right now, there's one thing I've done continually for 20 years, and that is I have stood still when I thought I could do nothing else, and I've just let God work it times I got ahead of the cart, a few times I, I tried to work through it, a few times I got in the way of God, but in the end, I've always learned that if I will just stay in the fight, if I'll just stay close to God, He works it all out. He works it all out for my good. I look back over my life, and I look at the times I thought I was weak, but the fact is, I had great faith, because I didn't quit. Some of you, just the fact that you're still in this church right now. It's big. Some of you, listen, some of you, just the fact that you showed up today with all you've been through with the enemy that's chasing you down. Some of you got so much Egypt coming against you. Just the fact that you're still having faith in God fact that you're still in this church. It's the fact that you still showed up today and got dressed. I'm telling you, don't you hold your head down. But understand, it takes faith to endure also. You've got more faith than you realize, brother and sister. You've got more faith than you know. Some of you should have been dead by now. Some of you should have been out by now. Some of you should have been killed by now. You should have been on drugs and strung out right now, homeless. Some of you shouldn't have made it mentally. You should have snapped by now. But you're still standing. And you know why you're standing? Because in you, deep down, you know that if you can keep standing, God will show you a victory. And you're right. He will. As long as you make sure that God's not trying to get you to work, and speak, sometimes you can just stand there and get a front row seat at the glory of God in your life. Every one of us, before we go to our promise, needs to have a moment where we do nothing. I feel the Holy Ghost talking to you right now. Where we do nothing. And we just let God work now. Oh, trust me, from experience, the longer you try to move in the way of God, He'll hold you back from seeing His glory. But the quicker you understand that there are some things you can do nothing to change them, the faster God can get you through that process. But you will have to face all of your fears in that moment. But hang on, brother, because the Red Sea is about to split open. God's about to make a way out of no way. God's about to create hard ground out of muddy swamp and let you have safe passage. And the good news is, is that enemy can't chase you down. That season of your life is over, never going to come back again. 
and you're going to walk into your promise and your future with freedom and liberty in the name of Jesus. Can we just open our heart for a few moments today and love the Lord? The Lord sent me here to tell you, you've got faith. You've got faith. You're standing here and you're, you don't even know how to move or what to say. And you're just sitting here going, I don't know. I don't even know what to do. I'm just here. That's okay. That's faith, my friend. That's faith. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand there until it breaks. Stand there until it changes. Don't give in. Don't compromise. Don't sin. Don't. Don't go the other way. Just keep it. Stand there. Let the enemy charge you up. Let the enemy lie to you. Let the enemy say what it wants to say. But stand still and tell God, I'm not moving until your glory shows up. I'm not moving until your might shows up. I'm not going anywhere until I see the mighty hand of God. What did I preach the other day? You're going to die anyway. Going to die anyway. You can't stop death, but you can find the glory of God. You can see the salvation of your God. Lord, help us to have faith in this house today and help us to know when to work, when to speak, and just when to be quiet and wait on the Lord. Help us, God, to know there's going to be a season when I've got to get my hands in this thing. There's a season when I can't even do it, but I can speak it. And there's going to be a season when there's nothing I can do but simply stand still and wait on the salvation of God. Let's let it download into our heart today before we leave. Let's let it download that God is wanting us to use our faith in all three ways. Where are you at today, church family? Where are you at right now, brother? There's probably various things in your life that you could apply each one differently and separately. Which one applies to you today? Thank you, Lord. You know what we can all do? I think it would be good if we all came down here to this front and just stood still as a symbol that I'm going to wait on you, God, no matter what I'm facing. Come on down here. You don't have to bow down. You can stand just as a symbol. Just stand. Just stand. I believe the Lord's going to bless today. I believe the Lord's going to speak to us today right now. Just come stand. Get close. We're going to stand. We're going to stand. We're going to stand for the Lord. We're going to stand still. Come on. There's, there's, a, there's a benefit to standing there's a reason why it says stand, because standing implies I'm going to live beyond this. Listen to me right now, church family. Standing implies I'm not dying today. Standing implies my God will come through for me. Standing implies I'm about to take a step. That's why the word is stand still, church. Don't sit still. Don't get comfortable. You're not staying here. Whatever you are right now, the Lord wants to tell you, you stand still because you're about to get out of it. You're about to move through it. You're about to transition. Standing takes faith because standing says, I will not stay where I am. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I'm standing and I'm going to watch you. I'm going to watch your power, God. I'm going to watch your power. Lord, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to declare to mountains to move. But when I have nothing left, God, I promise you, God, I'm going to, I'm going to stand still. Lord, renew our faith right now. There's people under attack all over this house. Renew our faith right now. Renew our faith right now. Sometimes you don't know what to do and you can't, but that doesn't mean you're going to lose. That does not mean you're going down. No, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. You're going to stand up and you're going to watch God bring you out of it. Let's exercise our faith right now. Our God is going to deliver us. Our God's going to set us free. Our God's going to make a way. If there's something you can do, you need to do it. If there's something you need to say, you need to say it. And if there's nothing to do and nothing to say, then you need to stand it. Watch God deliver you from the hands of the enemy. Come on, just keep doing what you know to do. 
Just keep standing by faith. Deliverance will come. Victory will come. In the name of Jesus, you will be free. It's coming your way. But stand by faith and believe that any moment now, I'm about to have victory. Any moment now, I'm about to receive a word of hope. Any moment now, God's going to show me the path, show me the way of escape. Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would help our faith today. Release great faith in this room right now. Release great faith in this room right now. God, I want to know how to use faith. I want to know the right way to operate.